Amen. Well, there's nothing worse than a guilty conscience. Nothing worse than having a guilty conscience. I, it will eat you alive, won't it? Anybody ever been there, man? Like, I, like you, you, did, you stumbled into something or you jumped into something, <laughs> either way, and you feel so guilty, you feel shameful, and you, you'd love to get it out right away, but for whatever reason, you've kept it in. And over time, man, like it just begins to eat you up from the inside. I love it. Thank you for nodding your head. The Bass Pro Shops guy, you're with me, right? You and I can relate because we've done dumb stuff. I don't know about you, but I have. I think you have. He's nodding hard. He has. <laughs> and my nose bleeds. Anybody, raise your hand. You've done some dumb stuff, right? And, and you know, some of those things are kind of small, so you kind of shake it off. Not a big deal. But some of them, man, like, you can't believe. I can't believe that me? I would do that? And I'd hurt that person? I'd hurt myself? I, I'd be in a position like this? And I have this pivotal point in my life. Do I come clean and get it out there, even though it's going to hurt? It's like ripping the bandaid off. Or do I try to cover it up and explain it away and get secretive? It's interesting. When we do that, it just seems like it, then it just makes a bad thing even worse. And in our text today, we got a guy named David who blew it bad. <laughs> Mike was talking last week about sheep. David the shepherd was a sheep and he began to wander. His eyes began to wander. If you remember it, you can go back and study it. 2 Samuel 11 and 12, it was this cool afternoon. David just woke up his, from his siesta. He's on the top of his palace back there in ancient Israel. You'd be on the top and you could see for miles. And, and he was kind of scanning the horizon and all of a sudden there's this beautiful woman named Bathsheba. She happened to be taking a bath. That's why they called her Bathsheba. <laughs> that is just terrible pastor jokes. He's like, yo, she's a hottie. Go get her. And David, remember now, David, the Bible says David is a man after God's own heart. So it, he, he loved God. He knew this wasn't right, but he let his human side take over. Anybody have a weak moment where your human side takes over you? I know that's not right, but guess what, man? Like this yearning in me. And he goes, his servants go get her, bring her back. He sleeps with her, gets her pregnant. Dave's like, oh, snap. What do I do? You see, Bathsheba's husband, Uriah, was where David was supposed to be. David was supposed to be with the troops in a battle in the spring. That's what kings did, good leaders did. Bathsheba's husband, Uriah, was on the battlefield. And Dave's like, oh man, I got, I, you know what? I'm not gonna come clean, I'm gonna cover it up. You know what I'm gonna do? I'm gonna send for Uriah and bring him home, get him wasted, and then send him home with Bathsheba He'll sleep with her. They'll think the baby is Uriah's. I'll be scot-free. Huh? I thought it was a pretty good plan. How many have been intoxicated, done some dumb, like, and all of a sudden, the engine starts kicking, hey, right? Pretty good plan, Dave. But check this out. I love this. Uriah, the man of God, goes, you know what? My homies are on the front lines. There's no way I'm going to go enjoy that with my wife and sleeps outside of the palace. Dave's like, oh, man, that ain't going to work. He tries it again. Uriah still won't give in. So what does he do? He, he grabs Joab, his, his leader of the army, writes a note and says, hey, take Uriah, go back to the battlefield, put him on the front line, and then have the troops draw back so the enemy will kill Uriah. Then Uriah, that's what happens, he is killed and now David goes, oh man, poor Bathsheba, she's pregnant. You know what? Her husband died in the battle. I'll be the savior and I'll actually go rescue Bathsheba and raise the kid in my palace. Got it. Covered it up. But wouldn't you know, over time, 
his insides just started eating him up. Anybody ever been there? You thought you got away with it? I've been there, thought I got away with it, and then it just eats you up inside, that guilty conscience. You, you try to mask it with drugs, with alcohol, with other things. You just can't get rid of it. One day, this guy Nathan, this prophet of God, comes up to David, King David. This took some cojones for Nathan to do. He comes to the king, and he tells him this story. You ready for the story? Thanks, Mike. You're with me. Tells him the story. He says, King David, I got to tell you this story, what happened in your kingdom. There was this really rich guy, and there was a poor guy. They were neighbors. The rich guy had all kinds of sheep and cattle. I mean, the guy was loaded. And next to him was this real poor guy. He had just one little sheep, one little ewe lamb. I don't know what an ewe lamb is. I'm guessing it's a small little one. And this poor guy had one, he's so poor, he's got one little lamb, he spoons the little lamb, he, you know, he feeds it dinner, like, you know, it's like, just, he's got one, he's poor, but he's happy, he's got the one. A traveler comes to the rich guy's crib, and the rich guy, instead of going to kill one of his many lambs to feed the traveler, you know what he does? He goes over to his poor neighbor, takes the one little Ooh, lamb, slaughters it and feeds it to the traveler. And David's like, what? That happened in my kingdom? Not on my watch. That dude's got to pay fourfold and we're going to kill him. And Nathan just, I, I can just picture Nathan just letting it settle in on big Dave. <laughs> hey, Dave, you're the man. You're the rich man. God gave you the entire kingdom. He gave you all these wives, this huge blessing. And you go to this one little poor man and take his wife. Now, put yourself in Nathan's position. Holy smokes, I hope David repents right now. He could kill me right now. Who am I? And even David has a decision. What do I do at this point? The truth is finally exposed after scholars submit almost a year went by. This was eating him up. He's, he's at this point. God reveals it. What do I do? Do I come clean and let it out? Or do I continue to keep it in and gnaw at my soul? What would David do? I'm glad you asked. Psalm 32, starting in verse 1. The Bible says, oh, what joy for those whose disobedience is forgiven, whose sin is put out of sight. Yes, what joy for those who, whose record the Lord has cleared from guilt, whose lives are lived in complete honesty. What happened? The guilt that he was living with, this, this, this fear, this overwhelming sense that I'm off with God in my soul, he finally confesses it. And number one, if you're your note taker, elation. Complete elation. Did you see it? What joy for those whose sin is forgiven. Anybody just joyful today that you know because of what Christ has accomplished on the cross, you're completely free? Like, you, listen, you're totally free. It's so wild. I, I get so jacked about these messages because I know me. Let me talk to my man in the Bass Pro, right? That's why we get jacked, because we're like, oh my goodness, like, no matter what I've done, you mean no matter what? You mean no matter what? I can relate to Dave. I can relate to him. I committed murder, and God still forgave. Are you kidding me? And you're here today at church, and you're going, what? Like, God can forgive me even though I've, I've committed murder or I've, I've had an affair or I, I have an addiction. Right now, you're, you feel so guilty because you have this addiction that no one knows about right now and you're trying to cover it up. Can I give you a good news? Listen, when you release that and, you're, and you confess before God and someone else, you are free, you are delivered, and you are healed. The, no medication is gonna take that away. It is your free will saying, God, I wanna get real with you you called me out, I'm gonna release it, and I'm gonna trust that Jesus Christ paid for it. He wants to clear your record. Anybody got, don't, don't raise your hand. You might have a record. 
Don't, I'm sorry, don't raise your hand. You got a record. There, there's this interesting thing that the president has. The president of the United States, it's a wild deal. Like he has this executive like power to just, is it called like clemency or expunging or something? It's like pardoning. Thank you. My son, my smart son on the front row. I need, thank you God for my son. Just give the dude a pardon, the lady a pardon, no matter what you've done. You're done. Just, just walk out of jail. How wild, like, you, you got a pardon from Jesus because he paid for your sin. And how many people, like, are still in jail and they don't take the free gift? Like, the president's like, you're free, go. And yet we stay in prison because of our pride and we go, no, I don't want to confess it and let Jesus pay for it. I have a friend who's a pastor. Uh, well, I know a pastor. <laughs> Let me just put it that way. Who's, he has this wild story. He's out, he's out in California. And how many know the real estate in California isn't cheap? Anybody know that? Like for a shack, you pay $1.52 million, you get like a shack. And this dude's out in Cali, and he had this house and had a mortgage on it. I, I think it's upwards of 500, 607 grand of debt that he had on his house. And one day he was sharing God's truth and some man of God came up to him and said, hey, God put it on my heart. He's blessed me financially and he wants the resource to flow through me to your mortgage company and eliminate your entire mortgage. <laughs> That's what I said. It's like, Want me to give you my number too? <laughs> and what do you think that pastor did? Did he put his hands in the pocket? Oh, that's cool. Thanks, man. Appreciate that. I really appreciate it. It's good. You know, good. Holy. The dude was in tears. The dude was overwhelmed. I have all this debt. And, and you're gracious enough to just pay it off? Are you kidding me? What could I ever do to repay you? He's like, nothing. Just receive it. When, 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 when you see me like on the front row in tears worshiping, please understand this is not a show. This is genuine. I know what I've done, and yet God's grace can forgive me and set me free and, and, and give me an amazing wife and children and allow me to be a part of this movement of God. Are you kidding me? I'm crying. I've been, I've been released from my debt, my friends. I know where I'm going. This is not churchianity to me. This is like, ah. By the way, my friend didn't keep on paying his mortgage payments. I think there's a lot of Christians, you're, 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 you're still trying to pay your mortgage payment and do good works to earn God's favor. Can I just tell you, it's finished. There's nothing you can do to earn God's favor. God's love is unconditional. His forgiveness is unconditional. You're going, no, but I got to do good to like kind of balance out the scale. No, you, no, you, you do good because you already been forgiven. It's just a natural overflow of your gratitude. Your good works are not connected to your salvation. That's the gospel. I'm not sure who that was for. Stop paying mortgage payments, man. It's been, it's been paid. So, so we're elated. We're not deflated. We're elated. You move real quick when you understand this truth from a, a life of depression and deflated to elated. It's, it's elation. I, I, hope that's a, I hope that's a word. Is it still a word? John Corson says this, man's greatest need is God's greatest deed. And when we're forgiven, something in our soul is released. And I'm like, my goodness. Hebrews 10, 17 says their sins and their lawless deeds, I will remember no more. The record is cleared. Psalm 103, 12, watch this one, guys, jot this one down. He has removed our sins as far as the east is from the west. Hi. That's a long way. Elation. Number two, if you're a note taker, suppression. You see, before David got to elation, it was suppression. Is that, is that, hopefully that's a word too. Do you guys know what that means? I think it's like stuffing something down. 
All right. Okay. Sometimes I make up words. That's the problem. So it is a real world. <laughs> word. Jot it down. Suppression. Verse three. Verse three. So be, before he got here, this is the season that he lived in. Look, look at what King David for almost a year, and I'm not sure where you're at. Maybe you're at right the same exact place. He was stuffing it. He was suppressing it. Verse three. When I refused to confess my sin, look what happened. My body wasted away and I groaned all day long. How many of you know your spiritual condition is directly connected to your physical condition? He stuffed it and something wasn't right in his soul. He wasn't free. And then it was, it was coming out of his, of his physical condition. Verse four, day and night, your hand of discipline was heavy on me. My strength evaporated like water in the summer heat. Anybody excited for the summer, by the way? Raise your hand. I think it's be like 61. That's like a heat wave. Some of you guys are in India or like, dude, I would be chilling out right now. It's interesting, this correlation between our spiritual state and our physical state. I've been praying about this for a while. And I was thinking about this idea of how when we don't release it, we walk around with a heaviness. And so, can I, I wanted to just show you a picture, and this thing is called a weighted vest. Can you take that for me real quick, please? I mean, that hurt, I just headbutted it right there. This is what you call a weighted vest, and real strong people use it to, to put more weight when they're doing pull-ups and stuff. I, Obviously, I don't wear this a whole lot. I didn't even know how to put it on, Kyle, so I'll just leave it like this. But I wanted to show you a picture because if you're in here today, it maybe isn't as chaotic as David where you committed an affair and got someone pregnant and then killed someone, but maybe there's something in your life right now that you haven't let go of, and so it's a spiritual thing that's not settling in your soul. It's manifesting itself in a physical way. And you're walking around. It's like, it's like you have a piano on your back. You have something on your chest. Sometimes you can't even breathe. It's a heaviness that's on you 24-7. It's, it's, it's a weighted vest. And this is the picture that, that David is talking about right here. He's like, dude, when I, when I, didn't, when I suppressed this whole idea, I didn't confess, it was a heaviness of my soul. In, in, in Psalm 103, it says, the Bible says, um, he gave him over to the request, but he sent leanness into the soul. It's a heaviness. It's a leanness. And until we deal with it, we'll continue to walk around with this heaviness. I wrote my note, suppression oftentimes leads to Depression. And depression oftentimes leads to addiction. Why? We're trying to medicate, self-medicate, and trying to reach something, but until we confess and come to Christ and get it clean, it doesn't matter what medication or what recreational drug we're on, we never can get to the root. I might mask it for a night, I might mask it for a month, but eventually that darn thing comes back and I got the heaviness again. A lot of times I'll sit down and I'll counsel people and they'll have mental health, mental health issues and they'll come to me and my very first thing that I'll lovingly encourage or challenge and I'll ask them, tell me about your spiritual walk with Christ. And let me just be very, very honest with you. Most people I talk to that are dealing with mental health issues They've never fully surrendered their life to Christ, at least given him an opportunity for a certain amount of time. I'm all in with Jesus. I've been forgiven. It's removed. This guilt is removed. And I'm beginning a lifestyle of interaction with God and others in a healthy community. And I'm serving God. And, and after that long, period, that long period of time, I give him that prescription after that, if something's still off mentally, maybe it's a physical thing and you go to some medicine from a physician. But how many people know if you go to the great physician first and see what he might want to do, 90% of the time, that entire condition is gone. It's eradicated. 
I just talked to a lady on our team, our worship team. She said, for 10 years, I was on medication, came to Christ, found my identity in Christ, was born again, and, and guess what? I took the pill, the gospel, and it completely freed me. I had to work that in, dumb dad joke. But I'm telling you, it's true. What happens? You come clean. My heart pains for the millions of people that they're walking confused and overwhelmed. Now hear me straight again. There are many, there are some people, they are walking with Christ. They are, they are connected with him and there's still something physical. Nothing wrong with medication at that point. Please hear me wrong. Don't hear me right. But there are a whole nother group of people that try to go right to the, the, the physician and try to get cured. Can we start here? I love the message translation of this whole idea. It says this, when I kept it all inside, suppressing it, my bones turned to powder. My words became day-long groans. The pressure never let up. All the juices of my life dried up. In Psalm 38, let me just read. Can I just read the word over us in this theme? I'd rather speak the word of God than the word of Todd. Listen to the word of God in Psalm 38, the second half of verse three. My whole body is sick. Maybe this is you today. You're listening online. You're in this auditorium. My whole body is sick. My health is broken because of my sin. My guilt overwhelms me. It's a burden too heavy to bear. My wounds Fester, this is David talking about this idea. My wounds fester and stink because of my foolish sins. I'm bent over and racked with pain. All day long, I walk around filled with grief. A raging fever burns within me and my health is broken. How about verse eight? Listen to this. Maybe you can identify with this. I'm exhausted. Anybody just exhausted? I'm exhausted and I'm completely crushed. I'm crushed. been trying to self-medicate, alcoholism for 10 and 20 and 30 years. I I heard of a man recently at Love Church who kept something suppressed for over three decades and finally got it out last week. Three decades, weight down, guilt inside. I came to just try to help someone get free today. Anybody just want to Want to just finally take this stupid weight off your chest? You want to get something off your chest today? The time is now. The time is now because number three, what's the key to this entire message? I'm glad you asked. Verse five, it's confession. Old school confession. You know why there's a revival breaking out in Asbury College and all over the nation right now? It starts with confession. One young man stepped up in the middle of the worship session that they've had all kinds of time. He confessed in front of everybody. He confessed his sin. It's exactly what David did. Because David, remember, he's at this pivotal point. What do I do? Nathan the prophet just called me out. I can have him oft and continue to stuff it, or I could come clean. What did David do? Verse five. Finally. Someone say finally. (laughs) Finally, I confessed all my sins to you. And I stopped trying to hide my guilt. I said to myself, I will confess my rebellion to the Lord and you forgave me. Watch this. Man, this is good news for someone. All my guilt is gone, gone. Now my sin is dead and gone and I sin. (laughs) You're like, do not ever sing again, pastor. My bad. Look it up. Gone. It's gone. It's gone. And I love it. Did you notice like, Something so powerful about owning your own sin. We don't like to talk about sin. We'd like to make excuses. Well, what really happened is I grew up in this house and then I blame it on my this and I blame it on my that. How about, how about we just own up to our own sin? That's what David did right there. He's like, he's like, my rebellion, my sin, I confessed it, it's me. He owned it and guess what? It came out. Is there, some, is there something right now that you gotta get off your chest right now? Maybe even now, let's, maybe as an act of 
like a prophetic prayer right now. Maybe you're confessing, and as you confess, this heaviness that you've carried for I don't know how long. Oh, that feels good. Maybe right now, maybe there's something, think about what it, whatever it is. Man, maybe right now is a prophetic act of humility before God. Maybe, maybe. I can't give you all a weighted vest, but maybe you just go like this. Just, maybe you just raise your hand real quick. I, this, this week, my wife and I had a couple of things we had to just talk to each other about, and we had to get rid of it. We had to come clean with one another on, on, on some, not anything that's gonna disqualify us from leading the church, but, but geez, I see your eyes. What do you do? You know? but, but it's, it's, geez, tough crowd. We, we needed to get it out, but listen, listen, there's something about it, man. Confess it to the Lord. Confess it to one another. The Bible says, man, when we confess it to him, I think it's 1 John 1, 9. If we confess our sin to him, he's faithful and just to cleanse us from all unrighteousness. And there's a freedom that happens. The Bible also says, I think in James, when we confess to one another and pray for one another, you may be healed. Maybe today, maybe this week, you just need to come clean with God and then come clean with someone you trust. Not someone that's gonna judge you, but someone that's mature enough to give you the truth, but give you in love. My wife has this, in, this ability to slap you upside the head and hug you all at the same time. I don't know how she does it. That's who you need. We'll love you enough to tell you the truth, but then hug you after with zero judgment because we know how much we've been forgiven and still are. Something about cleansing the conscience, isn't there? <laughs> When the kids were little, as much as they didn't like it, there were times where they needed to be disciplined and get it out. And there's something about that conscience being cleared. It's like, it's gone. And something in your soul doesn't, it's not free unless it's confessed and dealt with and judged. And so when the kids were little, we had this you guys ready for just a quick little parenting thing? Okay, here, here it is. Ready, ready, parents? Where are my parents? Where are my parents? Where are my parents? Raise your hand. Okay, okay good. This is going to be tons of love, tons of discipline, consistency throughout. We talk about discipline. We had a wood cheese cutting board at our house. And when the, when the boys would be kind of doing their own thing, doing something crazy, we'd look to them and we'd say, hey, guys, what you're doing right now is not honoring to the Lord and it's not honoring to your parents. You can continue doing what you're doing, but you are choosing the rod of discipline. It's your choice. You think I'm lying, too. You're like, some of y'all are losing your minds, yelling at your kid. Just, just do that. Hey, whatever you want to do. You have a teenage daughter right now. Bad attitude, doing some dumb stuff. I just saw a lady nod, so this is for you. <laughs> <clears throat> and your girl's not going to like me. So no more screaming and fighting and carrying on. Look to, you know, we'll call her Jennifer. Jennifer, you know how much dad and I love you. But lately, your attitude and what you've done is just not, it's not honoring to God. It's not honoring to your parents. I'm gonna give you a choice. You can stop with the attitude or stop with the action and repent of that, confess that, get, get it out, and everything's gonna be cool. Or you can choose discipline, which would be one outfit for the next two weeks at school. Your choice. I mean, all I want is God's best for your life, and I'm just <laughs> called to help you. It's your choice. And it's interesting because, tune in, stay with me, because this is powerful. I was studying this, and I was thinking about the power of cleansing the conscience, because when our boys would get out of line, as much as it was fun probably to go sin, like, when I gave them discipline, because sometimes I know you don't believe this, but pastor's kids, even though they got warned, they would still do some dumb stuff. So I'd say, okay, sorry, because dad loves you, I have to discipline you. The Bible says if I don't, I hate you, and I absolutely love you, so go grab the rod. So they'd go into the kitchen, they'd grab the wood cheese cutting board, they'd bring it to me, I'd put them over my knee, and I would get them a nice little swap over the backside, Actually, it was a pretty swift slap over the backside. And they would, ah, and then, you know, tears coming. I would hug them. And you know what's the wildest thing? Then they'd run away, and they'd be free. 
Their conscience was cleared by the discipline. Let me give you good news. When we come clean, actually Christ is the one that got the rod of discipline for you, and now your conscience is freed, and you walk away a different person. I don't need to self-medicate anymore. I transferred my guilt onto the Christ, and now I'm set free. Confession. Old school confession at church. I love, love church because they always make me feel good. (laughs) I'm just preaching the Bible, folks. The reason why David was able to move from bound and overwhelmed and broken because of stuffing and hiding his guilt for almost a year to free and elated was what? He had the choice. He confessed, and right at that moment, God forgave him. It's powerful. Hebrews 12, one says this, let us strip off every weight that slows us down, especially the sin that so easily trips us up. And let us run with endurance the race God has set before us. I'm gonna tell you this, man. It's a whole lot easier to run this race with Christ when we take that and we just get real with God, humble ourselves, and throw that baby off. Guess what? This thing is a marathon, and it can be beautiful, and you can enjoy the journey. Amen? God, thanks for this word. Man, you, you, you challenged me through this, and there's hope, and I'm praying now, even as we wrap this message up, I'm praying for those in the auditorium and listening online and they're identifying something that they've been stuffing for a while. And because you're a good father, you continue to move towards us. I love it. You're not out to get us. You're out to give us something better. And so would you search our hearts even now, all across the auditorium and listening online. Maybe we have been David. We've been suppressing Maybe we've been self-medicating, trying to just cover stuff up, trying to get through the day. I pray for another level of freedom in the house of God today, another area of freedom in our soul. I pray as you're pouring out your spirit all throughout the nation, we, we just walk with you. When we blow it, we'd be honest. I pray for courage for for men and women that just need to get real. I pray for an extra dose of courage. I pray for the prodigal son or daughter, those that maybe started out with you and for whatever reason, they're in a distant land right now. I pray no judgment, but I pray that they would just know that they have a God who loves them that just wants to see them come back. trust you to do it in Jesus' name.